Hey y'all, it's Kyle with another geography video, this time discussing the differences between the southern states. It's really easy to lump all the states in the south together, but there really are quite a few differences between them. And so in this video, I'll be discussing the various aspects that makes each state unique. I'll be talking about the physical geography, the climate and the landscapes, the people, the culture, the food, the music, and the economics. I'll be going over what makes each state tick, and what makes each state unique from the other ones. This is not the video to watch if you're interested in hearing things like People from Arkansas have fewer teeth than the ones in Mississippi, or South Carolina is on the coast and Kentucky isn't. And you're not going to hear things like, damn, Republicans are trying to destroy North Carolina, or damn, Democrats trying to turn Georgia into a liberal state. So this video isn't silly. It's not kindergarten geography, and it's not political. It's just kind of a nerdy overview of the southern states. So what are my qualifications to be making this video in the first place? I'm from California. What can I possibly know about the South? Well, my wife is from South Carolina. We met while we were both in graduate school at the University of South Carolina. We now live in Tennessee. We've been here for about 10 years, and I spent the majority of my adult life living in the South, and I've traveled all throughout the region. I've been to all the big cities, a bunch of small towns, been camping, hiking at national parks and state parks, been canoeing in all kinds of rivers, lakes, and swamps, and every year I go on a cross-country road trip, and if you're starting from the south, obviously you have to go through the south to get to the next area, so I think I have a pretty good grasp on the region as a whole. There are four distinct physiographic regions that make up the south. The Atlantic coast, the Gulf coast, the river valleys of the interior western south, and the Appalachians. And yes, northerners and westerners, they're pronounced the Appalachians. And the differences in physical geography between these regions leads to a big change in the climate, as well as differences in the culture, including the music and the food. Everywhere in the south has moderate temperatures during the spring, but this is also the wettest time of the year with the most rain and possibly severe thunderstorms and tornadoes. Everywhere in the south has hot, humid, nasty summers that can be unbearable at times. And everywhere in the south has relatively pleasant falls with nice temperatures and the driest weather of the year. But where it gets different is the winter. Throughout the Atlantic and Gulf Coast, the winters can be pretty nice, maybe a little bit chilly, but mostly pretty mild. But once you get to the interior parts of the south, they can get pretty cold, especially, say, Kentucky. Kentucky gets really cold during the wintertime. And so I live in Chattanooga, Tennessee, which is another spot where it gets pretty cold during the winter. So it's a big difference in places that are a little more interior. So I think Kentucky and Tennessee have the worst climate amongst the south, being that you know, again, it's really hot during the summer, really cold during the winter, and really rainy during the spring. So you have a really short window of time in the fall when the weather is nice, which is a lot different, say, in the Carolinas or the Gulf Coast, where, you know, again, it's going to be really hot during the summer, but the winters are going to be pretty pleasant. And in some parts of the Gulf Coast, the winter is the nicest time of the year. And, of course, in the Appalachians, it'll get really cold during the winter, but those are the parts of the south where the summers really aren't that bad because you're at a higher elevation, you have less humidity. So... You know, again, I think Kentucky and Tennessee have the worst climate in the south because this, the window of time where the weather is nice is so short. The differences in physical geography have also led to differences in food across the region. I'm sure it'll come as a big surprise to you to learn that along the coastal areas, you have a lot more seafood. And in the more interior parts of the south, land animals tend to dominate the dinner plate. One of the signature seafood dishes of the south is shrimp and grits. And I fell in love with shrimp and grits when I moved to South Carolina. And when I first heard it, I was like, man, this sounds pretty gross. But... It's really good. I really liked it. Something else that's very popular in the coastal areas is something called either Beaufort stew or Brunswick stew or Frogmore stew or maybe low country bowl. And yeah, it's bowl, not boil. But it's basically a big old pot where you dump some meat, potatoes, and corn into it and boil it up. So that's really good too. So the South has some pretty cool signature seafood dishes. In the more interior parts of the South, the signature meat dishes become more barbecue oriented. Barbecue is a way of life in the South, but there are some differences in the barbecue throughout the region as well. In the easternmost parts of the South, including the Appalachians, pork shoulder tends to be the dominant meat used for barbecue. In Alabama, you have a lot more chicken. In Kentucky, the traditional meat dish for barbecue is mutton. Memphis has pork ribs. And when you get to Arkansas, it tends to be a little more influenced by Texas to the west and Kansas City to the north, so you have a lot more beef there. In the parts of the south where pork shoulder is the predominant meat used for barbecue, you have three sauces that are the main ones that are used. The traditional North Carolina style is vinegar-based. In South Carolina, you have a lot of mustard-based sauce, and the Appalachian style tends to be tomato-based. Sometimes that's called the Western North Carolina sauce, but it's pretty much the same as you're going to get in Northwestern South Carolina or Eastern Tennessee. The traditional sauce used in Alabama barbecue is a white sauce, which is mayonnaise-based. 
the Memphis style tends to be a dry rub. And when you get to the western parts of the south, you have a lot more of the real thick hickory sauce. Chicken tends to not be my favorite meat to be used in barbecue. I love chicken, but I usually have it fried or cooked into Indian food. And I'm not really a big fan of mayonnaise either. So the first time I had Alabama barbecue, I was like, it's going to be chicken with mayonnaise on it. It's going to be pretty gross. But no, that's actually really, really good. And when I was putting this video together, I was saying, hey, to my wife, you know, we haven't had the Alabama barbecue in a while. We need to go back down there and have some more of it. We live really close to the Alabama border. So I'm thinking we might go down to Huntsville, see if we can find some good Alabama barbecue. I'm not as familiar with the Kentucky mutton-based barbecue. I've only had it one time. It was really good, but I'm not sure if where I had it, I consider the you know, a good place to get it. But if I had to say what my favorite style of Southern barbecue is, it would be the South Carolina style mustard sauce. And it's not because I'm biased towards South Carolina. I just really love mustard as a condiment. I could just, you know, drink mustard. I just love it. So, I mean, I just love all the barbecue throughout the South. But my favorite is the mustard-based sauce in South Carolina. And then you've got Louisiana, always marching to the beat of its own drum. Its traditional food dishes tend to be jambalaya, gumbo, and red beans and rice. And I love all three of those, but they're obviously quite a bit different than the traditional barbecue you get in the rest of the South. And now let's talk about the music. You can't talk about the South without talking about the music. Unless you listen to classical, polka, or music from other countries, you're listening to something that came out of the South. It came out of slaves in the Mississippi Delta doing call and response, and that led to the blues. And then you had some of these guys in the Delta taking these songs about working on the railroad, working out in the fields, you know, my worries and sorrows, my baby left me kind of stuff, and added guitars to it, and that became the traditional blues. All these guys took banjos over to the Appalachians, mixed it with Irish folk music, and that became bluegrass. And all these guys moved to the city, see if they can make a dollar play for these city slickers. A lot of the black musicians moved to Memphis. A lot of the white musicians moved to Nashville. And that's where you started to see kind of the disparity between what we call rock and roll and modern country. Listen to these names. They're some of the most influential pioneers in the history of music. Muddy Waters, John Lee Hooker, Bill Monroe, Ralph Stanley, B.B. King, Hank Williams, Johnny Cash, Loretta Lynn, Doc Watson, Ray Charles, Elvis Presley, James Brown, Jerry Lee Lewis, Little Richard, Carl Perkins, Otis Redding, Booker T and the MGs. These are some of the most important and influential names in the history of rock and roll or country. And they're all Southern. And I'm not going to sit here and say that every influential musician is Southern, but that's a pretty disproportionate number of people that have had a huge influence on music that are from the South. And then you have Louisiana, once again, marching to the beat of its own drum. This time, literally, the traditional music to come out of Louisiana have been jazz and zydeco. And these are quite a bit different than the rock and roll in the country had going on in the rest of the South. I think a lot of what makes Louisiana so unique is the physical geography. It's the only state in the South that has neither beaches nor mountains. I think it's had a big influence on the culture. Just about everywhere in the Deep South has swampy areas. The Okefenokee Swamp in Georgia is one of my favorite places to take my canoe, but nobody lives there. Nobody lives in the swampy areas of South Carolina or Alabama. But in Louisiana, a lot of people live in the swamps. That's where most of the people in the state live. You have about four and a half million people in the state. Approximately three million people live in swampy areas. And kind of like how Los Angeles is essentially a desert with a city on it, well, New Orleans and Baton Rouge and Lake Charles are just swamps with city on it. So I think that's part of what makes the Louisiana culture a little bit different. And also it's French heritage. A lot of the rest of the South is kind of like, oh, those damn French, they're pansies. We had to rescue them from two world wars. But Louisiana, they embrace their French culture. So again, Louisiana, very unique, but yet remaining unquestionably Southern. All right, so this is where the videos can get a little bit boring. I'm going to get into the economy of each state and what makes each one different. Okay, there's no sugarcoating this. The South is the poorest part of the country. It's the part of the country with the highest percentage of the population living in poverty and the highest percentage of the population living on government aid through either welfare or food stamps. Of the nine states I'm discussing in this video, eight are in the bottom 10 in terms of income, with only Georgia being inside the top 40. But it's not as easy as saying all these states in the South are poor and they're all the same. There's a lot of differences that go on between them. So I'm going to go over each state individually to see what makes each one tick economically. Going through the states alphabetically, I'll be starting with Alabama. Alabama traditionally has been the manufacturing leader in the South. Birmingham is known as the Iron City. The annual Alabama-Auburn football game is known as the Iron Bowl. You know, it's been kind of the, the Pennsylvania of the South kind of thing. But just like it is up in the Rust Belt, a lot of these manufacturing jobs have been left. And Alabama has done a pretty good job of replacing these jobs with auto assembly jobs. You have the largest Hyundai plant in America. 
You have a Mercedes plant there, and the brand spanking new joint Toyota Mazda plant is located in Alabama as well. So they haven't really created new jobs, but they've done a pretty good job of replacing the ones that have been lost in the manufacturing sector in iron and steel. You have a couple of decent sized banks with Regents and BBVA both being headquartered in Birmingham. You have some aerospace industry associated with the NASA Center in Huntsville. But overall, Alabama's economy hasn't grown as much as some of the other states in the South, and the population hasn't grown as much as a result. Arkansas is known for two things, Walmart and rice. And Walmart is the largest private employer in the U.S., and Arkansas single-handedly produces about half of the rice consumed in the U.S. So those are two very important parts of the economy, but neither one of those are really growing very much, and the economy of Arkansas isn't really growing very much, and the population isn't really growing much at all either. So it's a poor state, even amongst the southern states, and there really isn't much else going on besides Walmart and rice. Georgia has definitely been the leader in terms of economic and population growth in the South in recent years. They have a pretty strongly diversified economy that really helps to make the state stay afloat and maybe do a little bit better than the rest of the South. You have many major companies that are headquartered in Atlanta. You have Coca-Cola, you've got Delta Airlines, you've got Home Depot, UPS, and of course you have all the TV and movie stuff going on. There's kind of like an LA Junior, a lot of major uh, TV studios and you know, the whole concept of cable TV originated from Atlanta, and you have several cable networks that are still headquartered there. But it isn't just about Atlanta either. There's a lot going on in the rest of the state that helps make the state economically diversified as a whole. It's a nation's leader in carpet and flooring. It's the number one state for peanuts and pecan production. And even though those aren't as important as rice, they're much more of a cash crop. You have a big pulp and paper industry going on there. You have a large military presence with Fort Benning being one of the largest army forts in the country. And you have a lot of tourism, people going not just to Atlanta, but also to Savannah and the Sea Islands. So, you know, Georgia with this well-diversified economy is what's led it to be, you know, a little bit more better off economically than the rest of the Southern states. Next, we have Kentucky. Kentucky's a lot like Alabama. They have about the same population and it also has a lot of automotive assembly plants. It's where the Camry and the F-150 are. Those are the number one selling cars and trucks in the U.S and also where the Corvette is made. Of course, the Corvette isn't a big seller and the plant isn't a huge job maker, but it is still pretty cool to say you're the state where the Corvette is made. But just like Alabama, the automotive assembly plants haven't really created new jobs. They really replaced the jobs that were lost with the coal industry losing jobs. There are some other sectors that play an important role in the Kentucky economy. It's the home to the Yum Brands fast food conglomerate, and I love me some Yum Brands fast food. It's also the hub for UPS Airlines. UPS itself is headquartered in Atlanta, but the airline hub is in Louisville, and it's also the home to Fort Knox, which isn't the largest army fort in the country, but it might very well be the most important one. Another important part of the Kentucky economy, and my favorite part of the Kentucky economy, is right here. All this wonderful Kentucky bourbon. Kentucky is a world's leading producer of bourbon whiskey. I think about 99% of all the bourbon whiskey is made there. I think I have about half of it in my house right now. I, I can be a bit of a bourbon snob at times. It's kind of hard to see some of these bottles. They're so shiny, but this is my personal favorite one, Elmer T. Lee. Elmer, don't mess around. This is some really good bourbon. And uh, let's be honest, you wish you had this bar. You don't have it, but you wish you did. But yeah, bourbon whiskey, important part of the Kentucky economy. Next up, we have Louisiana, and just like with everything else, Louisiana does things a little bit differently. It's the only state in the southeast where the largest part of the economy is the energy sector. You have a lot of oil and natural gas, offshore oil drilling, a lot of oil refineries. There. So that's a very important part of the Louisiana economy, much more like Texas and much different than the rest of the southeast. They also have a few other things going on in the state. New Orleans is, of course, a huge tourist destination. You have a lot of huge trade shows and conventions there. You have Super Bowls and Sugar Bowls and WrestleMania and all kinds of major events going on in New Orleans. So big tourism for the state, big energy sector right now. So the economy is okay for Louisiana. It's not growing a whole lot. They lost a lot of population after Hurricane Katrina. And even today, you know, 13 years later, the population is not at the point it was before Hurricane Katrina. So it's not really growing too much, but it's not really falling behind either. But again, they will have to think about the future a little bit more because we're not gonna always need the oil and natural gas. And that brings us to Mississippi, and let's get real here. Mississippi is the poorest state in the poorest region of the country, and their economy is really struggling. And there isn't a whole lot going on in Mississippi. It's not the number one producer of anything. It doesn't have any major companies or headquartered there. It's just not a big hub for any sector of the economy. 
It doesn't have the oil and natural gas that Louisiana has. It doesn't have the big tourism that Louisiana and Georgia and the Carolinas have. It doesn't have a lot of the things that the other states have. And as a result, it does struggle a little bit more. And again, it is very poor. They tried doing casino stuff in Tunica and Biloxi, but casinos aren't going to be a huge player in your economy. There's only one Vegas. There's only one Nevada, and you're not going to be able to duplicate it. You look at other places in the country that have done the casino thing. Well, they're Atlantic City and Detroit. And what do both of those have in common? They're both cesspools. So it doesn't really work. It's not a way to really help out your economy because, you know, the idea is that, you know, people are going to come from other parts of the country to come down to Tunic or Biloxi for a casino vacation. But that's just not the case. The people that are going to those casinos are people from Mississippi. So people from that state are losing their money at the state's casino. So it doesn't really work out too well. And again, look at Atlantic City and Detroit. It didn't work there. And it's not working in Mississippi either. Next up, we have North Carolina. And North Carolina is a lot like Georgia, and it's been much more successful in the recent years. And the reason for its success has been pretty similar. They just really diversified their economy instead of putting all their eggs in one basket. They have a very diversified portfolio. There's a lot of things going on in the state. And they're not just replacing jobs, they're creating new ones and creating very good jobs too. They're creating high paying jobs for skilled people with college degrees and things I can't understand. And it's been a really important part of the, the growth in North Carolina. The Raleigh-Durham Chapel Hill area has three major universities and a lot of research facilities to go along with it. And so you have a lot of companies doing a lot of high tech stuff, including you know bioengineering and biotech and just a bunch of other really complicated things. And, but you also have a big aerospace industry there. You have a lot of things going on with national defense and the Air Force. You also have a big financial sector. Charlotte is the second largest bank city in the country after New York. And so you've got both Bank of America and Wells Fargo that are headquartered there. You've got BB&T, another big bank in the Southeast, which is headquartered, I think, in Greensboro or Winston-Salem. But either way, North Carolina is a big state for a lot of different things, a lot of things going on. And shocking surprise, just like Georgia, its economy has grown a lot better and at a much faster pace than the other states in the South. They're not relying on just one thing. And I think with that diversified portfolio, it's really gone to help the state quite a bit. Their neighbor to the South is, of course, South Carolina. And it's kind of in the middle between some of the states that have you know, kind of faltered a little bit and some of the ones that have grown pretty rapidly. You know, and just like Alabama and Kentucky, South Carolina has brought in some new manufacturing jobs. But the difference is that the manufacturing jobs in South Carolina haven't replaced jobs that were lost through other industries. These are new jobs. So they've got you know, a BMW plant up in the Greenville area. They've got, you know, the brand new Boeing plant, the new 787s are being assembled in Charleston. So those are new jobs. They didn't lose a lot of jobs and had those replace them. So there's been a lot of growth in the South Carolina economy in the manufacturing sector. They've also done a much better job at recruiting retirees from up north. And a lot of folks in the South don't want a bunch of Yankees coming down there. But at the same time, these retirees from up north are bringing their money and they're spending money and helping boost the local economy. A lot of these old folks from New York and Boston don't want to move to Florida anymore. They don't have to worry about hurricanes every year. They can move to South Carolina and worry about a hurricane every 10 years kind of thing. But, you know, they have done a pretty good job of recruiting those kind of people to help with population growth. And with some of the growth in the manufacturing sector, you overall have a pretty decent growth in the economy as a whole, although it hasn't been quite as strong as Georgia or North Carolina. And lastly, we have Tennessee, which is where I live now. And Tennessee is kind of in the middle in terms of growth. It's not quite as strong as Georgia or North Carolina, but it's doing better than Mississippi, Alabama, or Arkansas. There's a pretty diversified economy there. You have some pretty large companies headquartered in Memphis. You've got FedEx and International Paper. Nashville has a couple of you know, big corporate healthcare companies, including the Hospital Corporation of America and Community Health Services. You also have Unum uh, Health Insurance headquartered in, in Chattanooga, which is where I live. Um, you have, again, automotive assembly with Volkswagen in Chattanooga, but that really just kind of replaced the Saturn plant that closed down when GM decided in their infinite wisdom to close down the best division of their, of their whole brand when they closed down Saturn. But anyway, Tennessee lost Saturn but picked up Volkswagen, so that's a pretty good trade-off. Um, but overall, Tennessee's doing, you know, okay with diversifying its economy. I know I live in Tennessee. I have like 10 bottles of Kentucky bourbon on my shelf and not one of Tennessee whiskey. I don't know. I like Tennessee whiskey, but I really love Kentucky bourbon a lot more. So that's my long-winded overview of the South and comparing and contrasting the individual states. And 
like I was saying in the beginning, it's really easy to lump all the states together. And if you're from California or Colorado or Minnesota or New York or something, don't think that the South's all just a bunch of toothless, inbred, hillbilly trailer trash. I mean, you can find some toothless, inbred, hillbilly trailer trash, but that's not the way it is. You know, the South is a big region. It's very diverse. A lot of different types of cultures from one end of the South to the other. Various physiographic regions, beaches, mountains, swamps, big cities, small towns, all kinds of good stuff. There's a reason why the population is growing so much down here. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give me a thumbs up to let me know you approve. And if you're interested in stuff like this, I'm posting videos about geography and travel, especially about road tripping across the U.S. So you might want to check out my channel. That kind of stuff interests you. But yeah. Thanks for watching. Geography King signing out and about to do a half an hour seminar on the differences between using y'all and all y'all.